But before we look at Psalm 105, why don't we pray? Uh, Father, we come to you and we praise you for who you are and what you've done. And who you are and what you've done does not change no matter how we're feeling. So some of us might be feeling like you're very close tonight. And others uh, here might feel like you are far away. But our feelings do not dictate truth. Your word dictates truth. And your word tells us that you are always with us, that in fact you are indwelling us by your Holy Spirit, and that you'll never leave us or forsake us. So we know that you are always with us, and for all eternity that will always be the case, without, without any kind of deviation from that. We thank you for such a wonderful promise. And we ask by that same Holy Spirit that you would bless us tonight in our study of your word, that you would encourage us and strengthen us and use your word to help us to be more like Christ. Help us, Lord, to grow in Christ-likeness and in the knowledge of your word, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 105. The subtitle says, Tell of all his wondrous works. And so this is... Uh, these next two psalms, although we're just doing Psalm 105 tonight, the next two psalms um, are really kind of a, a look at the history of Israel from the, from the aspect or the perspective of how God has moved in the lives of his people. And so this is very, uh, if you like history, this is good. This is going to be exactly what that subtitle kind of implies, a telling of all of God's wondrous works. So this is a, a remembering, a, uh, a reporting of everything that God has done. So I'm going to read the whole thing through, and then we'll go through the questions, okay? Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name and make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When they were few in number, of little account, and soldiers in it, Wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. When he summoned a famine on the land and broke all the supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron, until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And the Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes. He turned their hearts to hate his people to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them and miracles in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark. They did not rebel against his words. He turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs even in the chambers of their kings. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He gave them hail for rain and fiery lightning bolts through their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. 
He spoke and locusts came, young locusts without number, which devoured all the vegetation in their land and ate up the fruit of their ground. He struck down all the firstborn in their land and the first fruits of all their strength. Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold, and there was none among his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. He spread a cloud for a covering and a covering and fire to give light by night. They asked, and he brought quail, and gave them bread from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. And he gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Now, remember what we just read as we go through these questions. Uh, remembering what we just read as far as, you know it was a history lesson basically, right? A recounting of what the Lord has done for his people Israel. And when you know that, you know the context now. That's the context. So this isn't anything outside of that context, and that's important to know because the context is, is vital to know as you read it verse by verse what it's talking about. So you can't get led astray by one verse to mean something completely out of context. When we read it all together, we understand what the context is. So we keep that in mind. We're going to do question one, which says, read verses one through six. What do these verses mean, and what is the context of these verses? Okay. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. So what it, let's go through those verses and, and knock out what these mean and what the context is. Remember, we just got done talking about the general context is a remembrance of what God has done for his people Israel. That's the general context. We'll see if there's any other subcontext in there as we're going through it, okay? So verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing praises to him, uh, tell of all his wondrous works. What, what is that just telling you? Who, who's getting glorified here? God. God. It's not, oh, and, and don't forget to raise up Abraham, right? Nope. It's just, it's all about the Lord and his wondrous deeds, his wondrous works. Uh, we glory in his holy name. And let the hearts of those who seek him rejoice. That's standard. Anybody who's seeking him, it's another way of saying someone who is his. Because that's the only people who seek him. Unbelievers don't seek him. Only those that he has regenerated will seek him. So these are his people. Only his people seek him. So glory in his holy name like the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Everyone who is his rejoice. In your heart. Glory in his name. And instead of seeking anything else, verse 4, seek the Lord. Seek his strength. Don't seek your own strength. Seek his presence continually. Don't try and do things in your own strength. Don't try and seek the, the presence of, of anybody else before you seek the presence of God. Just a general reminder. And what is good for the Israelites is good for us today. We seek his presence continually. We seek the Lord and his strength. Remember the wondrous works he has done. The wondrous works he has done. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Abraham. It's God. His miracles and the judgments he uttered. This is uh, all these different things. All glorifying God. Notice that. When, they, when 
when the psalmist looks back at what God has done and goes through a brief history of the Israelites, the one who is glorified, even though other people are mentioned, the one who is given all the credit, all the glory, and all the honor is God. Absolutely. And talks about the offspring of Abraham, descendants of Jacob, or the seeds, or the sons of Jacob. This is the people of Israel. So subcontext-wise, is the same as the general context. We're talking about the people of Israel. That's who we're talking about here. We're not talking about you and me today, although the principles that we're reading in these verses are true for us today, but the context is for them. And that's an important distinction. Like when you hear Jeremiah 29, 11, right? Oh, the Lord has a future for you, a future and a hope. Well, is that verse, there's two parts to that, right? Great verse, yes. Is that verse written to the Israelites in captivity by, by God through Jeremiah? Yes. So that's the context, right? So the context is that speaking to them. Now, part B of Jeremiah 29, 11 is, is that context showing us a principle of a truth in God's word that is also true for us? Well, yeah. But you see how you have to unpack it like that? Otherwise, if I tell you, oh, my life verse is Jeremiah 29, 11, well, okay, but eh, contextually, right? I would much rather that people look at it and be like, well, that was meant for the Israelites as a, as a sign of hope for them. Now, is it true that, that you and I, who seek the Lord in our hearts, that we also have a future and a hope from the Lord? Yes, that principle is true. But it's very much true to say, Jeremiah 29, context, 29, 11, context is pointing to Israel, not to you and me. So you see, we hold ourselves to a higher spiritual, uh, scriptural standard. I don't want to, you know, oh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> oh, by his wounds we are healed. You, you better, uh, you know, you don't need to be coughing like that, Michael. <coughs> really? Right? Oh, there's another one, but this is a little different, right? Isaiah 53, 5. By your wounds, uh, we are, by his wounds we are healed. Well, sounds, if I just read that verse, that this is talking about how, well, Jesus suffered so that I could be healthy. By his wounds I am healed. But when you read all of Isaiah 53, you realize that this is talking about spiritual healing. It's talking about salvation, that he's healing my spiritual needs, not my physical. And so you see how context makes such a difference? And so, it, you know, but it's important to acknowledge that like what we were talking about with Jeremiah 29, 11, that that is contextually speaking to people Israel. But it's speaking of a principle that was shown to us that is like a characteristic of God to his people. So we can look at that and say, well, you know, we have that same kind of blessing from the Lord that we have a future and a hope. And you can point to other scriptures for us that are pointing to that for us. Right, so we do a better job of explaining that than just tossing out any. You know, uh, I was just at Hartville Kitchen not that long ago, and they had a book in there, and it said uh, Bible promises, and it's broken down by uh, topic. So you open it up, and anger, right? A couple verses on anger, uh, jealousy, a couple verses on jealousy, uh, marriage, a couple verses on marriage, right? And some of them are in context, and some of them are not. And so you must be good Bereans, right? And not just fall yes. into the, the trap of assuming that because a verse has a word in it that it's contextually accurate for the word or the topic that you're looking for. I don't know how I got off track on that, but that is important. Well, that's because we're talking about Israel. I don't want people to look at, at Psalm 105 and say, oh, that's you and me. I'm like, no. We can, do, we can appreciate God in the same way that the Israelites are doing but contextually speaking, this is talking about the Israelites. Let's go to question two. Read verses seven through 11. Okay. He is the Lord our God, his judgments in all the earth. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. So you don't have to remind him. 
the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel on an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance because you earned it. Oh, wait, no, it doesn't say that last part. Right. Notice, no, notice, you had some heavy hitter names in there, right? Isaac, Jacob, you, you have all these things. But Abraham, but they're not being glorified. Again, it's God being glorified for his keeping of the covenant that he made with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. Again, that same context, talking about the people of Israel talking about how God has been faithful with his covenant for them. So these verses are, says, what are these verses speaking of and how do they help us confirm the proper context of these previous verses? The mention of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob tells you it's talking about Old Testament Israel, right? So we've got confirmation now, as we've read on, that we're right to say that the context here is Old Testament Israel. That's what we're talking about. So we have confirmation there because that's exactly what the scripture here is telling us. So you see how scripture will help you to understand if you're saying as you're reading through scripture, you go, I wonder if I'm right about this context. You'll find that you're right or wrong as you keep reading. That's why we don't like it when people preach and they say, uh, our verse for today's sermon and they give one verse and then they don't talk anything about what's above it or what's below it and they just take that verse and most time when people do that they are just eisegeting it and putting into it what they want to put into it using writing on that one scripture's coattails to give a message that they wanted to give instead of just reading scripture and giving people the message that God wants to give right some people call that lazy Andy Stanley calls that lazy preaching but if you just expositorily go through Scripture, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, oh, that's easy. That's, that's lazy preaching. Don't be, don't be fooled, okay? That's not, that's not lazy preaching. That's, that's the way the Lord wants it done. We're just messengers. So, you know, a king, when he gave a message in the Renaissance period, would not say, here's my message. Um, choose whichever section you want, and then you go out there with your abilities and you kind of just fine tune it and you just kind of say, you know, just get this one, in, you know, one or two things of what my message is, fine, whatever, you, you know best, go, go do that. No, you would have to read verbatim what was on that scroll, right? Hear ye, hear ye. And then this is what the king says. It's no different for pastors. Hear ye, hear ye. This is what the king of kings and the Lord of lords says. That's, that's what you do. And you know, say, uh, and, and uh, I'm just, don't mind me, I'm just going to skip this part. Right? You don't get to decide that. It's a message from the king. You're just the messenger. So don't let anybody fool you into thinking that, that, that expositional is lazy or not, not worth doing. We must do it. It's what is right. So these verses are speaking of what? When you see when it's talking about, uh, we know it's talking about Israel's history, and it's talking about uh, a word that starts with cov and ends in... And, yeah, covenant. God's covenant with, uh, I mean, the three patriarchs are mentioned here. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Covenant to give them the land of Canaan as an inheritance. That's important. When it says a thousand generations, what about the people who are a thousand and one? Are they just out of luck? Yeah, they're good. When you read stuff like that in Scripture, do you ever say, well, wait a minute, and then you, you get tempted to break out your abacus and, and figure out just numerically what's going on there? Or when you, do, have you learned that sometimes when you see that, especially in something like the Psalms, it's not, it's not referencing a specific time as much as it's saying a really, really long time? I get that. Good. It's like myriads of angels, right? Myriads and myriads of angels. Well, let's see, how many, how many are in a myriad? A lot. You're not meant to sit there and be like, well, I need to know the exact number of angels before I can move. No, it's a lot. And a thousand generations is just a really long time. So you don't have to sit there and be like, but what about the people in a thousand and one generations? What happens to them? No, it's just, it's just way, it's just 
poetic way of saying really, really, really long time. All of human history. That's all. Okay. Yeah. So when you see that, don't, don't get thrown off by that. Now that those confirm the proper context of the previous verses, we've said that already, right? Mm -hmm. The mention of the patriarchs show us that we're right as far as what we thought the, con the context was here. Any thoughts on those verses? Notice that it says it's an everlasting covenant too, right? When God gives a covenant that he's the one that's going to keep it, it's an everlasting one. That's the other way that you confirm that the thousand generations is not just a specific time, but meant to show a great deal of time. Because God himself mentions that this is an everlasting covenant. So therefore, it's for every generation, right? Without, without any kind of uh, exception. All right, no questions. We'll move on to question three. Read verses 12 through 15. Okay. When they were few in number of little account and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he, God, allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. Uh, what are those verses referring to? Who are the few in number of little account? Israel. Yeah, Israel. It's Israel. Baby, baby Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the patriarch period, right? So, you know, they're not a huge people yet. And so when they are in few in number and of little account, right? Baby Israel, little account, few in number. And sojourners in the land, they're wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people. God allowed no one to oppress them. It wasn't because Israel was so big, so strong, so great. No, nope. God. God allowed no one to oppress them. In fact, he rebuked kings on their account saying, touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. And that verse is obviously talking about Benny Hinn. No, God, God was on their side. God was on their side. Absolutely. And that's how they survived. They only survived because God was on their side. Now that is part of question three. Verse 15 is referred to frequently by false teachers and prophets. I cannot t I've lost track of how many times that verse has been thrown extremely out of context as a defense mechanism by false teachers and false prophets. You better be careful. You better watch out. God says, touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. You better watch it, buddy. All the time. Yes. You know, so, I, I think I heard that a few times in the Senate too. Might. Yeah, which, uh, no. <laughs> right? No. Yeah. Uh, just, no. Like, you don't have to worry. A pastor himself um, has no authority. All right? I've said this to some of you individually before. But a pastor himself has, has no authority. All right? I can't tell you what job you should take or who you should marry or any of those things at all. That, that's bupkis. The the only thing I have is to do what I said earlier. I'm a messenger of God's word. I tell you what God's word says. And that's where the authority lies, is in God's word. Yes. So that's it. That's where I have no authority. It's God's word that has the authority. Now, I can tell you what God's word says, but that's not me holding authority over you. That's me telling you what the one who has authority over you has said. I don't get to, to, to dictate Right? I just get to, to tell you what God has already dictated. And so, back to verse 15 here. It's referred to frequently by these false teachers and prophets. How do they use that verse versus how it's properly interpreted in context? So when they use that verse, it's a, it's a, it's a fear tactic. You better touch, you know, you think I'm a man of God? Well, you better not touch me. You better not come after me. You better not do any of this stuff. 
because you should not touch God's anointed ones. Or those people who claim to be a prophet on YouTube, and like the Lord says this, or the Lord showed me this, or I've got a word for today, the Lord has a word for you for today, blah, 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 blah. Hey, I'm a prophet, you better not touch me. Do God's prophets no harm. So they use it as a, as a fear tactic to intimidate and to fear. And most of the people it works on because they don't know Scripture. And so they're weak and they're vulnerable. And so they hear that and they go, well, boy, this guy knows Scripture better than I do. I better, it's got to be in there. I better watch it. So that's how it's used improperly. What, what does it really mean when we interpret it within the context properly? Do you, is this talking about uh, some guy on YouTube or Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland? Is it talking about any of those guys? No. No. What's the context? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, Old Testament Israel. And, and Old Testament Israel, his anointed ones, not anybody else. The, the idea of anointing is to smear with liquid or with oil, and you set them apart as special. So all of God's people are set apart and special. In the context of, of Psalm 105, all of God's people Israel that are set their hearts after him. In other words, those who have been regenerate and believe in him and put their trust and faith in him. All of them are anointed in the sense that they're all set apart and special to the Lord. In our modern day context, everyone who's saved is anointed and is set apart by God. Every single one. So in the context here, this is talking to, you were right when you, when you said Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Specifically, you know, you could take it and say there's two tiers here. It's talking about them and it's talking about his people. Because they're all both are set aside. It's just a general sense. It's just a general sense. This is uh, anybody that that is representative of God. Anybody who is representative of God. And and, and if when you read the context, it makes so much more sense than when somebody just yanks it out of context and uses it as a proof text as to why you shouldn't question their authority or why you should want... Don't you worry about it. Uh, what, I got a million dollars worth of jewelry on me? Don't you worry about that, right? Touch not God's anointed. Suffer his prophets no harm. You don't want to mess with God. Just turn, turn around, right? This is totally different. They're few in number, little account, soldiers in it, wandering from nation to nation, one kingdom to another people. God allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, and literally, it gives you the context. There's a re literally, when they were sojourning about, God was the one who kept them safe. He, even God even rebuked kings on their, for their sake, telling these kings, don't you touch my special people. Don't you do my prophets any harm. That's the context, right? Big, big difference. I mean, the minute you hear somebody say that and try and use it in the context of defending themselves in a modern day sense, you know that person knows nothing of Scripture. They're just twisting Scripture. They're not talking Scripture in context. These are, these are, these are giant red flags. This isn't like, well, I wonder if... No, no, this is a giant yes. red flag. Like, oh, I bet you they just... No, no, no. It's a giant red flag. It's a giant red flag. So we watch out for that kind of stuff. Any thoughts about that? Specifically also, verse 15, any thoughts about touching not my anointing? All right, good. I, 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 back when we were taking so many phone calls for the prayer ministry, uh, I can't tell you how many elderly people were, squat, were, were uh, taken advantage of. Um, by the so-called Christian ministries on TV mostly that um, were thieves, robbers, uh, in it for filthy lucre, mm -hmm. greedy, greedy for gain. And that was the only reason they were doing any of that stuff. And these poor uh, elderly people who gave and gave and gave uh, just... And then whenever they started to have any kind of doubts... How many times I heard them, well, I was told that I can't say anything because they're anointed and they're above me. They're, I'm under their authority. 
Can you use that verse oh, for us as people? Use it for anybody that needs a label. Yeah. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Lady come in the bank and ask for help with her checkbook, and I, I would say seventy five percent of the checks that she wrote were like a can of Coke run, mm -hmm. triple dollar, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Yeah. Now, when you run into something like that, you you tell the people what the scripture really means, and then you pray that God opens their eyes to it. Some people. They do have their eyes opened and they come out of that. Other people do not have their eyes opened because they are getting exactly what they want. They want that kind of relationship with God. They want to be able to buy a relationship with God. Some people want that. Some people go to Joel Osteen's church and say, this is awesome. And you tell them, no, 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 no. let me show you what the scripture says instead of what you're feeding on weekly. Let me show you what the scripture says. And they go, no, you're wrong. I love it here. Yeah. Right? And there's never a change. They stay there the rest of their lives, right? And pass away as a member of that so, church. So let me ask you this. So what's the difference between that kind of false teacher that does that kind of thing and the guy that was famous back around Luther's time for selling indulgences? He was a famous salesman. Yeah, I mean, they're... Um, you know, every time... The cock of, yeah, Tesla. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, there is no difference. So from Predatory Springs, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no difference. It's the same snake oil salesman kind of mentality, right? It's the same. And so there is no difference, you know? One's not more noble than the other. And, and did one of the apostles, somebody in the New Testament, they wanted to buy the power, and then something happened to the person that wanted to buy it? Yeah, Peter, 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 yeah, Peter, Peter uh, you know. Yeah, Peter, Peter rebukes that man, you know, because that, he sees the power of God and thinks, I can buy that. And there, no. Or the, you know, the other thing that gets used quite a bit is the, uh, the widow and her two, her two bits, her two pennies. Right? And so Jesus is sitting there and he points out this woman. Now you have to remember context. Right before this scene in scripture Jesus is talking about the false teachers and false religion of the day and immediately after that scene without a change of context he points out this old widow who goes up and puts her last two coins in the coffer and Jesus says look she some have given you know a little bit she has given everything she had and people look at that and a lot of false teachers and a lot of horrible pastors will say look you must be like this woman and give Give till it hurts. Like she gave everything. Look at how faithful she was. Oh, honey. No, 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 no. The context has not changed from Jesus talking about false teachers and false religion. He is not praising this woman. This woman is going up and, and that's a false religion. That's a false gospel to go up and take your money and put your money into the coffers of the church so that you might be saved. That's works. That's works, and it ties right in with what Jesus was saying about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and false religion and false teachers of that day. And so, but again, another issue of context. If I don't read what's happening before that story and, and, and see the context, I can pull that out of context and put it into whatever context I want it to fit into to elicit the response from you that I want. So when it's time to give, oh, I'll bring up that woman because you know what? Uh, I can shame you. This old woman had nothing and she gave her last bits. You might have 20 bucks in your account, but are you only going to give a dollar when this poor old widow gave everything she had? You should give that $20 too and have the same kind of awesome faith that she had. She didn't have faith. That's not faith. That's not genuine, real faith, is it? You know the gospel. She can be saved because of that action? No. She's putting her faith in the false religious system that she was familiar with that surrounded her, a system of works. Jesus was admonishing. He wasn't, he wasn't giving her an attaboy. Far from it. Have you ever heard that before? Far from it. Because if, if it's, you know, and, and read through that. You know, your own personal study time. Read through that. Now with your eyes being open, 
that, that it, you will see it in a completely different way. And again, it's all thanks to context. Context, context, context. And so it's really, it's really important to make sure that we have uh, every single time that you are looking at scripture, you should be asking what's the context, right? Every single time, every single time. Were you wondering where that's found? Yeah. Let me get it for you. Mark 12 and Luke 21. Widow's mite. Yeah, widow and the two coins or? Luke 29? 21. Uh, let's move on. Hey. Start getting into Hi. numerology. Wow. <laughs> How about some radical kindness? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't get me started. Okay. Better. Where's my sunglasses? I can. <laughs> uh, question four. Uh, read verses 16 through 22. And as we're reading that, we're going to ask the next question: Is what part of Israel's past is being remembered here? And what wondrous deeds and works of God are being mentioned? Uh, says this in verses 16 through 22 in Psalm 105. When he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until he had said uh, what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. What story of the Bible is that talking about? Joseph. Joseph and the famine in Egypt and his brothers, yes. That's all that. When he was sold into slavery by his brothers who were jealous of him and that sweet, sweet jacket. When he's put into fetters or put into uh, uh, chains, That was after Potiphar's wife falsely accused him, right? Mm -hmm. So this is recounting that whole thing. What wondrous deeds and works in that, in verses 16 through 22, what wondrous deeds and works of God are are mentioned? Right off the bat in verse 16. God, who summons a famine? God. God. He, He summoned the famine. He broke the supply of all bread. But... God also, verse 17. Yeah, yeah. Joseph. And remember what Joseph says to his brothers, you know, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. So right there it said, ahead of them. So God pre-planned, really. Exactly. Now, this is evidence of God being uh, sovereign, that he does not react. God is not reactionary. God isn't like, oh, what Michael do? Oh, I better come up with an idea on how to fix that. He's not reactionary, Correct. right? He, he decrees. He ordains. He decrees. He's sovereign. He sent Joseph ahead, knowing full well exactly what he himself was going to do with the famine in the land. What else? Uh, what other wondrous deeds are we seeing here? How about uh, verse 20? Yeah. Yeah, that was all thanks to God. Verse 21, Joseph being made ruler over number two in all the land. That was thanks to God, too. All of Psalm 105 is is meant to be a recounting of Israel's history and how God has acted faithfully, powerfully throughout all of Israel's history. How often do you take time to remember God's deeds like that? Is that something that you tend to do regularly, or is it something that when you do it, when it kind of comes to the front of your mind like it is right now? Not enough. enough. That's a good answer, right? Not enough. What's the benefit of, of doing that, of recounting all of God's wondrous deeds? What's the benefit of doing that? You, well, there would be a more of a relational. I mean, it develops yeah. your relationship with God. It's, yeah. And then you're not 
And I, I think to a degree it would change your entire life too. Sure. Because you're not like, well, I pray for my stuff. And it's not that God doesn't care about stuff to all. Yeah. Okay, but, you know, it, mm-hmm. it changes your attitude. Yeah. Right? It makes you feel closer. Makes you feel closer. Increases well, you're your glorifying trust. God. Yes, increases your trust and your assurance. Glorifying God, all these things are and, true. And you might even, you might even, maybe, um, have your eyes opened or something worked out that you can share that as a witness. Sure. To a friend. Or Absolutely. A, this yeah. is how. This is how. You know, God is faithful. God is true. And here's how I know it. I have it recounted in the Bible for me, and I have it in my own life, right? So I can give testimony of what God has done for his people, both Israel and the church, through scripture, for myself and for others. And I can give my testimony of how God has shown himself to, to be faithful in my own life. Now that's not the gospel, but you give the gospel and then you give your testimony on how the gospel changed your life because this is what God has done through that. And that's very changing. And if, you know, if God feels distant to you, that's one of the solutions. If, you, if you've had a, a day or a week or a month or a year where you feel like, I know that God is. I believe. And I believe in Christ and that, nothing's going to change that. But boy, he just feels distant. Right? And you search your, your conscience and you can't find any rebellion or any you know, sin that you, that, that's really clearly causing that feeling. You just don't feel like he's that close, right? Sometimes you can feel that way because you have unrepentant sin that you need to deal with. And other times, you don't have any that you can see major unrepentant sin, but you feel distant from him. This is a solution to that, to recall and recount who God is and what he's done through Scripture and through your own life. Because if you've got a bad memory and you can't remember what God has done in your own life, well, you've got Scripture, and you can remind yourself of what He's done and how He's shown Himself to be faithful. That's how you learn that He is trustworthy, is by seeing all these examples. So certainly that is worthwhile, and it gives us the opportunity to glorify Him and to learn to trust in Him and all the things that you guys said. All right, good thoughts, good stuff. Question five. Read verses 23 through 36. Okay. Then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And the Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes. He turned their hearts to hate his people to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. Oh, there's God doing that choosing thing again. Man, how dare he? Do you ever notice, just pause there at the end of verse 26, you ever notice that God's election and choice and predestination is everywhere? People like to talk about it as if it's something that got inserted during the Reformation after New Testament was finished. No. God's election and predestination and choosing is all throughout Scripture. He chose Abram, who we know as Abraham when he was a pagan worshiping pagan gods. He didn't, he didn't know the God of the Bible. He didn't know Yahweh. God went to him, right? Yes, he did. God chose him. God chose Moses and Aaron, too. God chose Israel. What about all those other nations that he didn't choose? How unfair of him. Do you see? But I bet you most people don't think about that. No, God has shown his characteristics. He never changes. So the same God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. And so when you, if you have a problem with God's uh, predestination and election in the New Testament, you better have a problem with it in the Old Testament too. Because it's both. It's everywhere. Back to verse 27. They performed his signs among them and miracles in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark. They did not rebel against his words. He turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. He spoke and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. 
He gave them all hail for rain and fiery lightning bolts through their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. He spoke and locusts came, young locusts without number, which devoured all the vegetation in their land and ate up the fruit of the ground. He struck down all the firstborn in their land and the first fruits of all their strength. What, what part of Israel's past is being recounted there? Exodus. Yeah, Exodus. right before they exit, right? So it's talking about the Exodus. It's talking about God's judgment on Egypt. Absolutely. The, if you had to summarize what wondrous deeds and works of God that were mentioned there, if you had to, if you had to summarize that, what would you say? Plagues. The plagues. God's plagues among Egypt. Interesting side note, every single one of those plagues was specifically pointed at one of the great Egyptian deities. I don't have one off the top of my head, but I can find you one. Yes, please do, mm -hmm. because it's yeah. like... Um, Isn't that neat, though? Dealing with different people, I just like... I like to be able to point out, this Egyptian god that you you know think is pretty cool, well, this is what God did to that Egyptian god, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So let's get over it. Yeah, you can have a, you can have a list of, of the ten plagues, and you can have a list of the gods, the false gods, that God was basically humiliating... You know, oh, you have a God of the river? Let me show you that that God of the river has no power to stop me because I am the only God. Exactly. When I turn that river to blood, you will see, right? And, oh, you have an Egyptian God that's a frog, part frog, part, part man. Uh, let me show you that I will humiliate any false God that you might have, right? And that's what God does. I love it. I love it. That God is all power. He will not be mocked, right? Yes, exactly. Just because he doesn't speak up at every, every little mocking that happens doesn't mean he's not keeping account. Mm -hmm. He certainly will deal with everyone and everything that has mocked him in his good time. Uh, what are the benefits of remembering what God has done here? Yeah, it matters. Sin matters. Disobedience or rebellion against God matters. I think one of the other things that, that I take from this myself as well is that this is a scenario, if I was to have described this to you without any you not knowing any scriptural background, if I didn't tell you the people's names or anything like that, but I described to you a smaller people who are in bondage in a, in a much stronger, much richer, much uh, much greater country, and I tried. You knew, and, but these are all slaves, and they've got nothing. Yeah. Straw for bricks, right? They got nothing. Mm -hmm. But in a couple of years, they're going to be released. They're going to win their freedom, and they're going to leave there a rich and prosperous, and really a a, a fruitful people. Yes. Just like Scripture says in verse twenty-four, that God makes them fruitful in the midst of their slavery. So even that's how good God is to his people. Even in the midst of difficulty, he is doing good and faithful, fruitful things. And so it's neat to see that, hey, even in insurmountable odds, that if you're with God, who can be against you? Right? I mean, there's, this would have been a good world. Everybody in the world would have bet on Egypt. Right? So that's a good reminder that no matter what the world does, if you're on God's side, you can trust him that he will act, that he will be faithful. What we don't know is how and when sometimes. Sometimes scripture tells us. But if it doesn't specifically tell us, then we have to just trust. And the way we're able to do that, the way we're able to trust when we don't necessarily know specifics is to look back on what God has done. Not just in the scripture, but in our own lives. Because he shows himself trustworthy and faithful 
And you can look back in your own lives, no doubt, and, and, and find times where you were going through something and you asked God to take it away or to save you or to rescue you out of this, and he didn't do it in the way or in the timing that you wanted, but he sure did it. Yes, he did. Right? And then you look back with the hindsight, which is 2020, and you say, ah, I see, I see what you're doing there, I think, a little bit there, Lord. Hey, right? So this, even though the context here is talking about uh, Old Testament Israel, there are principles here yes. that we can take ourselves and, and use. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on. Question six. Read verses 37 through 42. What a good idea. We're going to ask the same question that we just asked uh, this last one. What part of Israel's past is being remembered here? Uh, when he brought out Israel with silver and gold, and there was none, none among his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. He spread a cloud for the covering and fire to give light by night. They asked, and he brought quail, and he gave them bread from heaven in abundance. What's that? What's the bread from heaven in abundance? Manna. Manna. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. What part of the Israel's past is being remembered there? The Exodus. The Exodus. More of the Exodus. This is after they're leaving Egypt, right? And notice that, so this is the time in the wilderness, and notice that God provides everything they need. Silver and gold for when they get to the promised land and be able to, to start the country and get everything together. He's got, what, manna from heaven, quail even, water. Not only that, a cloud and a pillar of fire. I mean, God is certainly taking care of them. Not only that, it says... Uh, among his tribes, none of them stumbled. I mean that nobody fell and stayed down. That's an important note. That, that no one stumbled, no one, no one fell. God kept them all. That's encouraging. Yeah. Person there, except for saints, right? Yes, yes, yes. And these are all things that are, are praiseworthy. Now these are all, notice as well, that... This is a very uh, positive yeah. description, right? We, we know that in the wilderness, uh, Israel was completely faithful the entire time, <laughs> right? No, 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 not at all. So you could say that this is a very um, positive outlook, right? And the idea is, is that the psalmist is not mentioning all of what they did wrong because the point is to praise God and show God's glory and provision, right? That's that he faithfully carries out his covenant. That's the idea here. That's the so it's kind of a, a summary that God took care of every single one of their needs because of his promise that he made. So that is important. I mean, you could he could have brought up how, you know, Moses disobeyed God when uh, with the water and the rock in numbers he could have brought that up he doesn't he could have brought up in that with the quail uh that the people were complaining god always oh, bring us out here can't we have some meat you know see that's all i could think of as i was reading this it's like that's all i can hear yeah in the back of my head as i was reading this this week it's like well the quail it's like oh yeah, yeah it's 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 not so much the, the the context of the psalm is not to focus on israel's failures but on God's perfect provision and how he never fails. Yeah. God is faithful even when we are not. Very important. Yeah. Anybody ever eat quail before? No. Is it good? No. I tend to just, when I, when I used to hunt quail, I would just put it in soup. Because I'd be like, yeah. The quail that the quail that I had around the place I used to live ate a lot of clover, so it was very clovery, a lot of clove taste to it. So that's why I was like, okay, yeah. Even if you carefully cleaned it and didn't didn't get any of the stomach juices out, you know, you were perfectly cleaning that thing. It, I still swear that I tasted clove all the time. So I would just I'd love to make uh, instead of chicken wild rice soup, I do quail quail wild rice soup, and then it took away. I wouldn't taste the clove then. 
But it's all right. It's not bad. <laughs> Anything that starts with the letter Q, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, question seven. Read verses 43 through 45. And what part of Israel's past is being remembered here? Oh, wait, did I miss the end of the question? I did. What has God done in your past that's praiseworthy? That was the end of question six. I'm sorry, I missed that. What has God done in your past that is praiseworthy? Everything. Everything? Uh, well, so. <laughs> uh, he, he brought me here. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And he brought me to a point to embrace the doctrines of grace mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that I was resistant to. Sure. That's uh, And we're all resistant to God in totality at the very beginning yeah. go back far enough and we can all point to that yes. time even if we were you know faking it and saying like no no i i know i'm for the lord i i'm 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 his i i love god yes oh yes i'm i'm his but then everything i did and said and thought outside of that told otherwise so if you know like you take a verse now now to me personally and i realize this is subjective okay but mm -hmm. You got that verse that says, cast all your cares on him. Yeah, First he Peter 5, 7. You. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, before I embrace the doctrines of grace, yeah, I believe that, but I And now I look at that verse, and I realize with the doctrines of grace, that verse actually means something. Yeah, it comes to life, right? It does. So, does. so does the verse that comes before it. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time, and then cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Yeah. So I can humble myself because of what God has done and because he cares for me, right? That's, that's why he's the only one I'll bend both my knees to. Right. He's the only one I'll worship. He's the only one that I'll yes. serve. And I guess the, the rest of the scripture just, I mean, it reads different now. Yeah. yeah. It, it reads, it, it's, it, and I'm not going to say I always get it right, but there's a certain excitement now on a certain yeah. zip. Oh, yeah. I think part of that, too, is the excitement that comes through. And this is part of the reason why when people um, start to see the scriptural um, truths of God's sovereignty and the doctrines of grace where that all of a sudden when God opens your eyes to it you see a path through scripture that you never saw before and then all these blank blanks that used to be there you find start getting filled and that's exciting not only that it's like when they say you're here it's like digging for gold and you just, you're yeah. just digging up more gold bars yeah you keep finding gold. stuff yeah never stops mm -hmm. mm. to that point and to your point as well so much better than the person who goes to a church service to get a fix by having an awesome worship service oh it's all experience oh that was such an awesome that song and the drums and da da da, da and they start right that's that that lasts for about man, two days maybe three and then it starts to fade away right and then I, I got to get my fix. I got to get my fix. Whereas, whereas the scripture, when God opens your eyes to that, like you guys are talking about, you are always finding little bits of gold anytime you're in it or meditating upon it. And that has a totally different kind of power behind it that lasts. It's not that temporary fake um, experiential, you know. You get experience from it, but it's not by itself. Yes. But it serves them instead of right. serving God. Yeah, and when people look for experiences or those kinds of things, what it really is doing is it's showing a lack of faith. If you say that, you know, like, well, I really believe in God because I had this really awesome experience at church service the other night, you're, what you're really saying or if you say, like, oh, I believe in God because I see, you know, these miracles and these, these wonders that happened at this church and stuff. What you're really saying is that you wouldn't believe without it. And Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen, not touched. Right? And so it's Scripture first. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and his enlightenment of Scripture into the hearts and minds of God's people. 
which helps you to grow in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ, which is what God's people will automatically want. Like that's, that's what the real ones want. If somebody says, like, oh, yeah, I love God and I love Jesus, but eh, I just can't get into the Bible. Well, then, that, that's a, that's a, that's, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't jive. That's an oxymoron. I just can't get into the Bible. Right. It's an oxymoron. That's square peg, round hole. Like, no, that don't fit. But the problem is, is that so much squishy evangelicalism has, has made that, like, well, maybe, that, no, 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 let's be black and white. No. You don't have a love for Scripture? Let's read through First John. Let's see what other ones you're not hitting. So that you doubt your salvation, so that you fear God, which is the beginning of wisdom, so that you can truly come to him. And then I guarantee you that you'll have a desire for his word. What girlfriend, what girlfriend, uh, what wife loves her husband but would never read his letters that he sends home from war? Yeah. Dumb. I mean, come on. These, we're, just, we're just making excuses, right? That's just making excuses. I, all right, back on track. I forgot about that last part of question six. Now, question seven. Read verses 43 through 45. So he brought his people out with joy. His chosen ones, oh, that word. His chosen ones with singing. And he gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. What is, uh, what is that describing? What happens after their time in the wilderness? When they entered in. Yes, that's what these verses are describing, their entry into the promised land. And notice the parallels between entry into the promised land with joy and with singing and our spiritual entry into heaven, our promised land. Hey, we'll be singing, we'll be joyful. But then you look there at verse 45. Yes. God had a purpose behind doing that, and it says there that they might keep the statutes and observe his law. Yeah, so that they might obey him that they might that they would keep and observe and have obedience towards the lord so this is actually a a scripture that if you agree that the church we're in the church age now if you believe that the church is going to go to heaven and we're going to be singing and we're going to be rejoicing and we say yes yes be like well then you know the other part of that verse verse 45 also applies right it's it's not the same context but we have parallel, right? There's a parallel there. So I can say if, if those things are parallel, if, if that is parallel, joy and singing, entering into the promised land, that I can see a, a church parallel there that when I go to be with the Lord in heaven forever, I'm going to sing and I'm going to rejoice. Well, I can't just say, but hit the bricks when I get to verse 45 because I don't need to obey. <laughs> you can't do that, right? If you're going to use that as a parallel, and say, we see the context is, is Israel here, but again, we see a parallel and a principle that God's people, those who put their faith and trust in him and those that he chooses and saves, that they will enter into his promised land with rejoicing and singing. And the whole reason God did this is so that he would have a people to obey. Okay, so now you understand how there is no gray area where someone can say, well, I'm saved, I just have zero interest in obeying God. That doesn't float, does it? No. It, how, what? Because all of this has been about God's work, God's provision, how it's perfect, how he saves his own, delivers them out, provides for them, does everything that's necessary for them. And if you're going to take that, that parallel and say, well, I'll use that as a principle for myself today, it fits. But then you must also take apart take the part that talks about obedience yes not only you're gonna not only do you have to be obedient but you're gonna want to you're gonna want to perfectly obey and not be able to which is why you're going to be singing and rejoicing when you do get to the promised land because you will finally be able to be a hundred percent obedient and perfect that's one of the reasons why we look forward to that time of obedience because that's what is god has put that inside of us so obedience then is a mark of one of god's chosen ones not perfection but a desire for obedience 
Any thoughts or questions about Psalm 105? Good job, guys. Next week we'll do Psalm 106, and then we're going to take a break uh, for a little bit, and we'll go through the parables of Jesus.